So glad we can share together in this new series called Wisdom from Proverbs. And it is such an important and valuable time to focus not only on the book of Proverbs, but on what does it mean to be wise. And so, in fact, the, the title of the message this week is Wise or Foolish. And uh, I have been reading Proverbs for years, and it's, it's exciting for me to see that some of those concepts have actually embedded themselves in my soul so that I'm actually making decisions around them. And one of the places where that really first started was uh, I was a youth pastor in a, in a church in Linden, Washington. And uh, I was fairly early on there. The youth group was small and struggling. And uh, I was kind of new at this job. And, and so one of the things that happened is we had a fellowship hall we were working on and it was still in process. So it had a nice flat wooden floor. And a couple of guys came in and they rode some skateboards around. And uh, you know that when a skateboard meets wallboard, the wallboard loses. So they ended up putting a kind of a dent in the, in the floor. And, and one of the elders came to me and he was upset about that. And, uh, and I understood that they'd put a lot of money into that building and it was important to them. Um, but he seemed to be saying something more than that, like kids are a bother. <laughs> And it's funny, as I was reading in Proverbs uh, that next week, I came along Proverbs 14.4, and you may think it has nothing to do with this, but listen carefully. It says, where there is no oxen, the stall is clean, but much is gained by the strength of an ox. And, and it clicked to me in my mind when I thought, you know, the, the wisdom from the world side said buildings are important and looks are important and, and having nice facilities and protecting our investments. But when there is an ox in the stall, there's a mess. And so what's the comparative value? Would you rather have a neat building with everything that's all kept well or would you rather have young people that are coming to hear and know Jesus and, and following him wholeheartedly? And you see the the point there was, if you put those values together, if you choose what's more important, it's that life change for teenagers. And so I, I jokingly referred to that as the, the life verse for youth ministry or for children's ministry. And that's why we want to have a room full of kids running around and talking and kid noises. Because if you have a church that is still and quiet and pristine and there's no kids there, that's a dying church. And so I, I want to help you start looking at Proverbs for ways to change your way of looking at things. And in fact, what that's called is to become wiser. And so we're looking at the book of Proverbs, and as you read through that, you'll find that there are four different categories that are mentioned frequently. And the first nine chapters is kind of a cohesive piece where a father is saying to his son, Here's what I want you to get. Here's the potholes in the, the road of life. Here's some challenges. Here's, here's some ways in which wisdom is so important. But then he goes through not only the first nine chapters, but then on through and says, there are simple people. Simple means you're just starting out. And it's often people who are unclear about what their life direction is. And then you have wise people. And he, and he lifts that up and says, here's, you want to become a wise person. So important. And then he says, there are fools. There are those who will not become wise and they are making foolish decisions. And then he doesn't spend a lot of time, but he also talks about wicked people. And so I want to walk through each of those four categories. And on your notes, either on your, on your app or if you're taking paper notes, um, I, I gave you a spot there to write down some observations and some questions and, and maybe even to ask yourself as we walk through it, do I tend to be a simple person or a wise person or a foolish person or maybe even a wicked person? And I think if we're honest, we have some elements of all of them, but the goal is what is the majority of my life look like? Where am I mostly and how do I get mostly to be a wise person? So let's look at those categories. The first is a simple person. And the definition is they're just unaware of the reality of life's dangers. Um, there's no shame to this. We all start this way. Uh, when you're a young person growing up, you just don't know. You don't know things about life. You don't know how to take care of a car. You don't know how to drive. You don't know how to, to invest your money. You don't know how to make wise choices for a life career. 
And everybody starts out simple, and there's no problem with that. The problem is if you continue to be simple. And so we were talking about this. Uh, you can't just say all teenagers are simple, although we all start at some level, because there are 12-year-olds <laughs> that, are, that are saving money for their first car and being very wise, and there are 40-year-olds that are driving BMX bicycles because they've made a bunch of ridiculous choices and they've ended up there. And so a person who is simple is unaware of the reality of life dangers. Sometimes it's even that, that, that pride of youth that thinks nothing will ever happen to me or I won't have those same problems. And it also means that they're undecided about pursuing wisdom. And I've seen a number of young people grow up in the church and they get all the information about what it means to follow Christ and about what the Bible says. But when they start interacting with high school friends or when they go to college and they're influenced by the philosophy of the world or by, again, peers, they, they are making their mind up. Am I going to follow Christ for myself personally or am I going to follow the culture and the way of the world? And so that's a simple person. And there's a very powerful piece right in chapter 9 where Solomon uses two visual pictures. He talks about a woman named Wisdom, or Wisdom is personified by a woman, and a personification of Folly as another woman. And I'm going to read this to us, and it'll be on the overhead here as well, in Proverbs chapter 9. It says, Wisdom has built her house. She set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She sent out her servant, and she calls from the highest point of the city. So it says wisdom has made this scrumptious feast set out, and now she goes out into the highest points of the city, and she says, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come, eat my food and drink the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways, and you will live walk in the way of insight. So he says that the simple person is receiving this invitation. The wise, the wisdom says, come, learn, grow, change. I'm inviting you in because you have a lot to learn. And then just a couple verses later, it says the other side. Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of their house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. Now, I've studied the Bible for a long time myself, and, and, and that's just one of the characteristics of wisdom is that you keep learning. And I'd never really noticed that wisdom and folly both give exactly the same invitation. So the picture is this simple person is walking down the road, and wisdom is calling to them, and foolishness is calling to them. And it's saying, and she goes on to say, to those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there and that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. So the writer to Proverbs, Solomon says, let me tell you, that simple person's walking down and he's being called to by both sides. And the, the one choosing of wisdom leads to incredible riches of wisdom and the other one leads to the dead. He said her ways are deep in the dead. So if you are simple, it's not a shame if you're young and simple. It's part of the process of life and choosing. But if you continue to walk down and re refuse to choose wisdom and you remain simple, then eventually in Proverbs it talks about the simple having very little hope. So... Wherever you are, wisdom is now calling to you today, saying, come on in, let me invite you to learn and to grow and to change. And you have to decide how you're going to respond to that invitation. The second group of people we're going to spend the most time on, and that is the wise. And what are the characteristics of a person who is truly wise? I don't mean, and we talked about how easy in our culture it is for people to emphasize somebody who is very skilled at a sport uh, somebody who's very good looking, somebody who is powerful or wealthy or funny or just a, a social influencer. And, and we place all of those things at a very high level. And so what the, 
the scripture, what Proverbs is trying to do is to say, let's raise up wisdom, a wise person. That's more valuable than all those other categories. And the first characteristic of a wise person is they were always gaining more wisdom. Uh, chapter one in Proverbs, he says, these Proverbs are written to help educate the simple. And so the wise can add to their learning. So a wise person, here's one of the characteristics. You never think you have arrived. You don't think, I've got this. I've, I, I'm ready to now tell everybody else. I don't need to learn anymore. And it means that you are reading and listening and, and talking to people and asking good questions. Um, often when couples are coming for pre-marriage counseling, I suggest that they go to some of the couples that they admire and just sit down and have a conversation and say, we're just starting. Um, what are some of the best things you have learned about marriage? I, I think very few of them do it. But that's the kind of mindset that says, I want to learn. I'm willing to, to, to read books and listen to podcasts. And, and in fact, uh, on your outline there, I put a podcast or a, a, it's uh, actually a, a recording in, on YouTube of a guy named Henry Cloud, who is a Christian psychologist. And he has an excellent talk called The Wise, the Foolish, and the Evil. And some of what I'm sharing with you comes out of this, but he goes into it in quite a bit more depth. So here again, here's an invitation. I'm going to give you some wisdom. Here's a place you can get more wisdom. Uh, keep on learning. And here's our verse for the week. It says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So he says, here's how you know if you're wise. What? You're continually wanting more. That a wise person doesn't think, I've got the answers. I've got the opinions. I know it all. And I'm afraid we run into a lot of that kind of an attitude it says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it cost you all you have, get understanding. So that's the verse we are challenging you to, uh, to learn this week, to memorize. And it says that there's a passion of wise people to get wiser. And that means that he, he acknowledges education is expensive. And education is expensive on the front end, I call it. When you go to seminars, when you read books, when you have lunch with wise people and ask good questions, that's the investment of your time and your energy and, and, and it, sometimes a lot of money if you're going to school or whatever that, that front side of seeking wisdom is. And then wisdom also has a backside. That means <laughs> when you fail, when you have an idea, when you think you're right and you step out there and you blow it and, and you get corrected or you or you get somebody else giving you advice or criticism. And either way, it's expensive. It's hard on your, it's hard on your ego. It, it's sometimes hard to go through the crises of a, of a failure. So he says, wisdom will cost you, but it's worth it. And I have a little graph that was brought out when we went through a, a seminar that we actually are going to be introducing to the church in the next few years called Unique, Y-O-U-N-I-Q-U-E, Unique. And it talks about how we're wired and what God wants to do with our lives. And, and she had this great uh, challenge for us. She, she talked about the difference between head knowledge and wisdom. And here, here's an idea. You, you get a new concept or a new challenge and you first of all hear it. And then maybe you understand more about it and somebody explains it or you actually watch somebody who's a good example and you get it. And then you say, yeah, I like it. I think this is true. I think it's right. That's what we should do. And then there's this big black gap between that and using it and owning it. And so the, the big piece here, and one of the things that she said is you can hear something, agree with it, and say that's for sure. In fact, what I just said, knowledge is important and wisdom is what God wants us to seek. And you can, yeah, I agree with you. Good idea, pastor. I, I think that's what I should do as well. I, I'm on board. And then there's this gap because often we never do a single thing about it. And she calls this here the, the keystone habit. It's that place where you say, okay, now that I've agreed with that, now that I actually say, that's true, I want to become wiser, what is it that helps you actually begin to change? How, how do you actually work that into your life? And so she challenged us with a couple of keystone habits to go from hear it to live it, and one of the things she said that really caught my attention is, this is as far as sermons can get you. 
Now, to a guy who focuses a lot on sermons, to help people hear it and know that it's from the Scripture and agree with it, and yet often people walk out of church with no intention of doing anything really about it. And in fact, let me just ask you a question. <laughs> Last week, we challenged you to memorize a verse and to read through some of the Proverbs. Did you do it? And I know maybe you're reading somewhere else and maybe you have something else going on. But do you get my point? It's easy to agree verbally and intellectually and never actually make a change. So, so what are some of those keystone habits? Well, you say, I know I should read the Bible more. I know the Bible is important. It's a source of wisdom. So I totally like it. I agree with it. I'm all over it. What has to change? Well, you actually have to have a time that you set aside. You have to, to get on your, you know, maybe you're on a version plan that you share with somebody else for a little accountability. Uh, maybe you go to a Bible study where you have some homework each week and, and that group interaction helps you actually begin to study it for yourself. See, that's one of the most valuable things in spiritual development is for you to study the Bible for yourself. But how do we get there? How do we actually make that change? Um, some other keystone habits. I want to be wise. Well, I, I know that uh, Pastor Jeremy and I were talking that reading books that are, that are focused on, on spiritual life and growth and church leadership, and those are so helpful to me. They, they not only give me new information, they stir me up and give me passion. So, so I said, I need to start doing that. <laughs> uh, I asked Jeremy this week, how many books have you read this year so far? You know what he said? 27. That's incredible. He gets up early in the morning. He's starting to read. I come into the office. He's reading his books. And it's like, he's not doing it to show off. He's doing it because he wants to learn. And here's a keystone habit that, that changes that. And what's maybe even more exciting to me is I have, a, I have another friend who's 71 years old. And he comes into our prayer time often saying, here's a book I'm reading, and it's a book on prayer, or here's a book on the, the shaping of the, of the 21st century mind, and he, he just is continually still learning. And that's such a, an awesome example for me. And then there are people that, while they're doing you know, mundane things with their hands, they're listening to, to podcasts, or they're watching a, a teaching series, or they're, they're learning all the time. Now, quick question is, is that you? Last week or two weeks ago, we talked about that wisdom is knowledge in action. And there's a, a critical piece that often as Christians, we get all kinds of Bible information and all kinds of encouragement for life change. But unless we actually put it into somewhere in our life, it's just head knowledge. And wisdom is when it becomes something that you actually own and it changes your life. So, a wise person is always adding to their wisdom. A wise person also responds to correction. That's the backside of education. When you fail, when somebody tries to point something out to you, how do you respond to that? And I want to say, um, that is emphasized all the way through Proverbs. Here's a very important one in 17.10. It says, a rebuke impresses a discerning person more than a hundred lashes a fool. This is Seriously, one of my favorite Proverbs, that a simple word of correction goes further into a wise person. And you'll see there are synonyms called discerning and, and prudent, and there's a number of, of synonyms that are around the idea of being wise. But it says, one rebuke goes further than beating a fool half to death. Why? Because a fool doesn't want correction. They don't want to learn. And a wise person, even if it's uncomfortable and painful, they will say thank you. Now, I know that not all correction is valid. I know that sometimes people are just critical because they like to control. And so that doesn't mean that you are thrown around by everybody that criticizes you and run to whoever's going to control you. But it, what it means is that when you hear a uh, an advice or a criticism or a, or a correction, that you ask yourself, do I need to learn something here? We had a situation years ago where the, there was a kid in the youth group that came when Craig was first a youth pastor, and, and she said, I don't like to go to worship. It, it's lame. Uh, our worship is lame. 
and Craig was kind of frustrated because he was working hard to improve it, and and Will was kind of challenging or defending him, and we were both saying, "Oh man, that that hurts to feel like you're working hard and getting criticized." And then we paused for a moment, and I said, "But is it true?" And I think that's the question you always have to come back to, because almost all criticism from a from an insightful person has at least a kernel of truth. And unless I'm willing to say, yeah, uh, maybe that's 60% wrong, but it's 40% right. You see, a wise person, and this is, this is really a critical test about whether you're wise or not. Wise people adjust to the light. So when the light is shown into our lives from the Word of God, from somebody who's speaking in church, from a good friend, even from a critique or a, or a correction. When the light comes, the wise person says, is this true? Do I need to, do you know, I need to adjust? And, and I actually like this picture because it's, it's a surgery light. And a surgeon's light is to show what's wrong so that the surgeon can make a difference. And that's where the Holy Spirit, we, we surrender to him and we say, okay, God, I'm trusting you. And yeah, I do. I, I'm foolish in that way. And I do have that motive. And Please take that out of me. And that's a wise person's response. The, the idea of a, a rebuke impressing a wise man more than 100 lashes the back of a fool has caused me to create another proverb which says, a wise person can learn from anyone and a fool can learn from no one. So let me ask you, how did you handle the last time somebody criticized you? Somebody said you should do this differently you should have done that. And boy, I tell you, this season there's been a lot of that. Do you react and you get angry and you get defensive? Or do you look for and say, is there some, is there some wisdom there? So the third characteristics of the wise is they're aware of the life's dangers. The, the book of Proverbs, especially the first nine chapters, the father's saying to his son, son, listen, you're going to get down the road of life and there's some there's some predictable potholes. Sexual immorality, man, it can wreck your life. Alcohol, ah, such a trap for so many. Um, financial commitments that you can't, really, you can't really sustain. Boy, that can really blow your life up. And choosing bad friends, man. And so, so he sits down with his son and says, let me tell you, here's some things that you need to look ahead. And a wise person makes their choices aware that I am vulnerable that this could happen to me, that I need to be careful, I need to make wise choices to take care of those predictable potholes that are ahead of me. And then lastly, a wise person wants to pay it forward. A wise person wants to be able to take their wisdom, and boy, parents, especially with your kids. I remember taking my daughter Jody up to college, and she had been wise and listening and responsive, and it just hit me like a wave, like, man, there were so many things I wished we'd talked about. I, I wish I had done a better job of, of handing off some of the things that I've learned. And of course, the beautiful part is that that's not the end of the story. We've had lots of great conversations with our girls, and they are all learners. And so that idea, especially for we who are parents, says, how do I give my kids the most important wisdom? Because too often... We focus all of our attention on things that are not going to last and are not really going to matter. And how do we put the most important things out there for them? So how do you handle it? First of all, we need to be a wise person. And then when you are dealing with a wise person, you talk to them, you coach them, you challenge them, you encourage them, you give them good information so that they can become wiser. And in fact, if you look uh, chapter 3 of Proverbs, it says, My son, do not forget my teaching but keep my commands in your heart. They will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. The, the chapter two and chapter three, there's 10 different ways in which wisdom will benefit you. And he's trying to say to his son, let me explain to you how important this is. So that's great parenting. Now let's look at the, the third category, somebody who's a fool or some of us when we are fools, let's say it that way. The fool, first of all, is wise in his own eyes. There's no humility. There's, I don't need wisdom. I don't seek it because I already know enough. 
And uh, there's a proverb about that. It says, do you see a person who's wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for them. So what's that really mean? It means if you don't think you are a fool, you don't see where you've been foolish, you're in grave danger because fools don't realize that they're fools. They don't go, yeah, I'm a fool. I don't care. No, they, they masquerade in their own head as a wise person. And uh, I have to tell you, I have too many stories about that. One of them in particular still gives me kind of a, a sense of, uh, of embarrassment. Um, I remember as a, I probably was in my mid-30s and I went down to Dallas for a seminar and it was a, you know, a good place of learning. But I remember walking by and there were some of these you know, stands that were set up where there were different people that were offering different programs and different things that were for sale. And uh, this, one, this one group had guys from Dallas Theological Seminary and they were, you know, just fresh out of college, had their master's or doctor's degrees, and they were offering coaching services for pastors. And I walked by them and I thought, ah, they're wet behind the ears. I've been a pastor for this many years. I, what could they teach me? And man, through the next several years at Family Church, I struggled with not knowing how to do some things. I'm not very good at administration. And then I, I, I ended up making some poor calls and ended up in all kinds of struggles. And, and the Lord tapped me on the shoulder later and reminded me of that arrogant moment when I thought, what do I need to learn? I'm 35 and I've been a pastor for quite a while. And the answer to that question is so much. That there are so many things I'm still learning. And a fool thinks, I've got it. I've arrived. I, I have, my strong opinions are correct. And that's a characteristic of a fool. The second characteristic, which is almost absolute, is that they react to criticism. There, there's that inner lawyer that, that stands up when somebody tries to correct them or teach them or, or give a different opinion. And they react to correction. That a fool has a deep pride about their own understanding. And so let me say it to you in this way. This also comes from from Henry Cloud. Wise people adjust to the light. Fools adjust the light away from themselves. So when the searchlight comes into our life, do we look at what do we need to, to change or to let God change? Or do we quickly grab that light and blame somebody else? Oh man, that's as original as the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Do we, do we discount it? As soon as somebody says something negative about you, I'll tell you, in milliseconds, you've thought of, who are you to tell me this? And what about this? And you don't do that either. And man, we are so fast at defensiveness. <laughs> That's the characteristic of a fool. That when the light comes in their life, instead of seeing what needs to be corrected and humbly admitting it, they turn it on somebody else. They, they gaslight and say, I never said that, or you shouldn't feel that, or you're making that up. They spend a tremendous amount of energy I remember sharing with somebody something that had been shared with me and that I was concerned about in their life. And they listened for a little bit, you know, and the first thing they said is, who told you that? <laughs> I'm not really interested in dealing with the problem in my life. What I want to know is, who leaked my secret and how did it get to you? And man, that inner lawyer, that defensiveness, that's a sign of a fool. And, and boy, I, I do that so easily and so quickly. How did you respond the last time somebody corrected you? How did you respond when, when somebody tried to share something with you? When somebody tried to, to give you some advice? The third characteristic of a fool is it says they're enticed by bad choices. Uh, let me be clear. All of us are enticed by bad choices. There are all kinds of ways. And in the picture in the Proverbs is that this woman named Folly is calling to this son saying, come my way. You know, we, we all get enticed, but a fool seems to say, I don't really care what the consequences are. I want what I want. So if that's your take on when somebody tries to warn you of some things that might be dangerous or give you a caution, if you think, I don't care, I want it, that's a sign of a fool. And then the last thing which shows up all the time 
is Proverbs 15, 2. It says, the tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. Uh, one of the interpretations, that, or one of the versions says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. That a wise person will share things in a way that makes them easy to hear and easy to understand, and, and you want to be part of that. But a fool, his mouth is just like a fountain of folly. He just talks to hear his own opinions. And I'm sure you know people like that, and maybe the people around you know somebody like that. So he is rash in words and actions, the foolish person. And, and there is that ongoing process of, of saying things that are hurtful, um, not holding confidences, and there's all of these characteristics. If you go through the Proverbs, man, there's so many that are about the tongue and what a slippery place the tongue is. And, and particularly... A fool can't control his tongue and a wise person is very, very careful with their words and thoughtful and, and that's the characteristic of what the words are. So what does that mean? Those two obviously are the big focus points of Proverbs, how to be wise and how to recognize fools. And Henry Cloud says, you know what you do with a fool? You don't talk, you don't coach, you don't try to, to do that because they will not listen. Fools understand consequences. You need to say, if you're the boss, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you're the parent, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And sometimes it involves boundaries and just pulling away from somebody who is continually being a fool. The last category that we just mentioned le- briefly is it talks about the wicked. In chapter one, he says, my son, don't let the wicked entice you. And there are people that are so angry and they've been so hurt that they just want to burn things down. They just want to destroy. And, and sometimes they do it with civility and sometimes they do it with violence, but they're, they're looking for revenge, for correction. And if somebody tries to correct them or give them advice, they react with vengeance. And Henry Cloud says, you know how you respond to them? Police, lawyers, barriers. <laughs> you have to realize that you can't talk with them. They're not interested in you setting up an improvement plan and consequences. You just have to move away from them and protect yourself. So the book of Proverbs is about how to recognize these four kinds of people, but particularly how to recognize in myself when I am not being wise and when I am. And I want to give you a last thought, and I want you to listen carefully here. This is an Old Testament book, and it's about how to have success in life. But there's a big missing piece, and maybe you've thought of it as we went through this. Somebody can can have good success in business. They can be wise in their choice of friends. They can handle carefully the potholes of life and never know Jesus. You see, the book of Proverbs is incomplete without that picture where he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. That's chapter three, five, and six. And Proverbs points to it, but the New Testament tells us that wisdom leads us to Jesus, and Jesus leads us to wisdom. And so you can be worldly wise and have a good life, but we need Christ in our lives for us to have a great eternity. And so don't miss that as we talk through the Proverbs as well. So I'm going to challenge you to think about how you are wise and how you can become wise, and I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors, and they're going to give you a specific challenge for how you can make this apply to your life.